Hello, here I am again. And I'm not going to talk about Pavlovian conditioning for a change. So you might be happy about that. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the PREMAC principle and uh, response theories of reinforcement. This is a really interesting story. I mean, uh, so in instrumental conditioning, the question is, uh, what makes something an effective reinforcer? And for a long time, people thought that uh, things that are reinforcers were special kind of stimuli. And that's certainly true about food. You know, food is special stimulus. You need nutrition to uh, survive. And uh, so it, uh, there were theories about what made food special. Well, it turned, uh, Premack had an entirely different approach to all this. And uh, he thought about the question of what makes something an effective reinforcer. And if you think about food, well, what makes food an effective reinforcer? His uh, answer to that question is very, very creative, very unusual way to think about things, but it turns out it was really useful. Uh, instead of thinking about food as a special stimulus, he looked at what is the uh, baseline probability of eating versus pressing a bar to get a pellet of food. Well, the baseline probability uh, for rats pressing bar for food it's much higher for eating than it is for pressing the lever. And uh, Premack elevated that to a principle which says that in order to have an effective reinforcer, you have to uh, uh, provide opportunity for the animal to engage in a behavior that is much more likely than the instrumental response that you're trying to reinforce. And so he uh, uh, was the first to propose that uh, reinforcers were special kinds of responses. And what's special about them is that they have a high probability of occurrence. And so that's essentially the PREMAC principle. And in an earlier experiment, uh, which is illustrated in the next slide, he compared uh, uh, thirsty rats <laughs> in an instrumental conditioning situation and rats that were not thirsty. When you take thirsty rats, their probability of drinking is much higher than the probability that they will run in a running way. And under these circumstances, you can use <clears throat> drinking to reinforce running behavior. And um, by allowing the animals to drink after they've run a certain amount, they're going to run more and more. Uh, you can't use running uh, as an instrumental response and drinking as a reinforcer if the rats are not thirsty. Because in that particular case, drinking has a low probability, but running has a fairly high probability. It turns out rats that are not thirsty tend to run quite a bit in the wheel. Well, under those circumstances, you can use running as the reinforcer. And if you do, it will increase the rate of drinking. So what's critical here is not that uh, the reinforcer involves running or drinking, but whether the reinforcer has a higher probability than the instrumental behavior that it reinforces. So this introduced the general notion that you can use responses as reinforcers. And uh, that was a huge advance, particularly in applied uh, applications of instrumental conditioning procedures and applied behavior analysis. Uh, if you want to try to encourage uh, you know, great school kids to complete their homework, you don't want to be handing out candy all the time. <laughs> but you can tell them if you complete this assignment, you're going to get to go to the playground that much sooner. So the activity of playing on the playground is an effective reinforcer for completing academic work assignments. Uh, and one of my kids was in, uh, I think, first or second grade. <laughs> Uh, he, he came home and uh, told a story that uh, the teacher was, would allow them to dance on the tables in the class if uh, and they did all their uh, academic work, which is a marvelous use of the PREMAC principle because kids love to dance on tables. Uh, and it's unrelated to academic work, but you can get kids to do their math assignments if the reinforcer is in 10 minutes of dancing on the tables. Of course, I wouldn't want to be the principal walked by and saw these kids jumping up and down on the table. What's, it looks like chaos in the classroom. Uh, but actually, it's a very clever use of the PREMAC principle. 
Okay, so Freemac principle is pretty straightforward, um, but we, uh, there is no, not much theory behind it. If we may look at the next slide, uh, one of the big problems with the Premac principle has to do with measuring response probability, and I don't want to get into that because that's kind of a complicated story. Uh, but another problem is it doesn't tell you what the mechanism is. Why is it that a high probability behavior is going to reinforce a lower probability response? And uh, the person who's provided an answer to that question is another very quirky, very creative psychologist as shown on the next slide. Uh, and his name is uh, Bill Timberlake. Now, interestingly enough, uh, David Premack was at the University of Missouri when he did the work on the Premack principle. So it's a you know mid Midwestern state school. Turns out Midwestern state uh, universities, the University of Missouri, University of Iowa, University of Wisconsin, University of Indiana, these places have terrific psychology departments. There's a lot of really uh, uh, highly significant work has come out of those uh, kind of departments. So we first heard from University of Missouri uh, and uh, the Missouri Tigers, <laughs> right? And uh, Timberlake was a University of Indiana. Incidentally, uh, that's uh, uh, also a scoop, uh, one of the places where uh, Skinner spent some time before he went to Harvard. Anyway, uh, Bill Timberlake asked the question, you know, what makes a high probability response an effective reinforcement? And he, he noticed, noticed, you know, eating is a high probability response for uh, uh, hungry animal, uh, rats and drinking is a high probability response for rats that are thirsty. But when you use food or water as a reinforcer, you are restricting access to that high probability response. And uh, uh, it occurred to him that the critical uh, manipulation that creates a reinforcer is this restriction of access. And that led to the response deprivation hypothesis. And the notion here is that you can take any behavior and you look to see what is the baseline probability that this behavior will occur if you restrict access to the behavior such that they can't maintain the baseline rate, then that <clears throat> you've created a disequilibrium and that makes access to that response a, an effective uh, reinforcer. And this is obviously true for uh, uh, food pellets uh, as uh, reinforcers. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, imagine a rat pressing a bar Instead of getting one pellet of food, he gets a bucket of food. Uh, that should be a huge reinforcer, right? If the rat presses the bar against a bucket of food, what are the chances that that rat's going to press the bar again? Well, it's going to be zero for a couple of days until he works his way through that bucket of food. So it's not the food itself that's reinforcing, but the fact that you can't get in as much of it as you would like. And uh, there was a, a really cute book, kids book, uh, uh, written by the folks that did the Berenstein Bears uh, stories. And uh, it, you know, kids are really excited about a birthday as a reinforcer. I know my, my grandkids are talking about their birthday uh, that's going to be, you know, six, eight months from now. I'm very excited. So in this book, I said, well, if you like birthdays, we should have a birthday every week. And so they describe what happens when the Bernstein Bear kids have a birthday party once a week. And what do you imagine happens? Well, you know, the first one is pretty fun. Second one's okay, third one, fourth one, and after a while the kids say, hey, I don't want any more birthdays. So there's no response deprivation there. Uh, so response deprivation is a really powerful tool for creating reinforcers. And uh, so it, it has also become uh, very important as a tool in applied behavior analysis. And, uh, and the neat thing about it is uh, and that you can make this up. You can find these reinforcers on the fly. 
So I took one of my grandkids to take music lessons, and he wasn't having any of it. <laughs> he, he, he was, um, so I took him to the music teacher, and we, we, we went week after week. And this this violin teacher was really clever. So at some point, uh, my grandson would plop down on the couch <laughs> and uh, you know refuse to pick up the violin and do what she was asking him to do. <laughs> Well, if he plops down on a couch, that gives you a reinforcer, right? You can use response deprivation. You can tell, well, you can sit on the couch, uh, but uh, if, if that's what you really want to do. Uh, but before you do that, let's do this exercise first. <laughs> so I've often used uh, response deprivation uh, as, as a way to uh, motivate behaviors that kids are, it works with adults. It works with everybody. <laughs> and why does it work? The next slide shows you a little bit of the story about that. Uh, and this is a little bit more complicated. It has to do with bliss points and uh, the general concept of behavior regulation. I love the term bliss point. I mean, imagine if you, you lived at the bliss point. <laughs> this is actually a technical term in economics. And what it represents is where you want to be if you could have whatever you want, okay? So the bliss point, in this case, we're talking about two different activities for a teenager, uh, listening to music versus uh, studying, okay? And you, in a baseline phase, you don't put any restrictions on the, on the teenager. And so you look to see uh, what their bliss point is for these two activities. And as you might imagine, they're much uh, happier to uh, spend time listening to music. So the music uh, uh, ta spent time on the music is much higher than the spent, uh, time spent uh, studying. Now, if you, uh, so that's the bliss point. You can disrupt the bliss point uh, by uh, linking these two behaviors such that in order to, uh, have a chance to listen to music, you have to spend a certain amount of time studying, okay? And in this particular example, we've got it set up. So one minute of studying is going to give you one minute access to, to uh, music. And uh, that's the schedule line, the, that, the vertical, uh, that uh, oblique line, 45-degree uh, line going up from the origin is, uh, is where you are restricted to be if uh, once this uh, instrumental conditioning procedure is put into place. And as you'll notice here, uh, once uh, you require one minute of studying for each minute that the uh, uh, kid uh, uh, has a chance to listen to music, that schedule line doesn't go through the bliss point, <laughs> okay? So that creates disequilibrium. And uh, the, uh, the teenager is still wants to wants to be at the, this point as a point of attraction. That's what you. That's the place where you really enjoy. Well, how to get back to the bliss point? Well, to get back to the bliss point, you have to increase your studying time. And so this uh, notion of a bliss point, and the notion that an instrumental conditioning procedure. Uh, creates uh, a disruption of that bliss point that provide and uh, that uh, serves to uh, uh, provide an explanation for why response deprivation actually works as an effective method to produce increases in the instrumental uh, response. So this is a really interesting uh, kind of concept. Uh, uh, has a lot of uh, practical uh, implications. Uh, it's uh, highly important in, in applications of uh, instrumental uh, conditioning uh, uh, procedures. And it's a, you know, drastically different perspective on what makes for a reinforcer. I mean, we're a long way from thinking about reinforcers as special kinds of stimuli. Reinforcers are activities, and these activities serve as reinforcers under special circumstances, circumstances that uh, prevent us from 
being at the this, uh, uh, bliss point, circumstances that create disequilibrium and our efforts to reach uh, and return to that bliss point are what causes changes in our adjustments in our behavior, which end up uh, resulting in increases in the instrumental behavior. So uh, this is a pretty, <laughs> pretty complicated uh, process and uh, but it's it's really fascinating, isn't it? I mean, I, who, uh, did you ever think about this kind of thing when you thought about instrumental conditioning? Did you ever think about this when you first heard about it in introductory psychology? I bet not. And uh, we'll talk a little bit. We'll talk more about what gets you back to the bliss point in, uh, in uh, the next uh, next episode. So until then. Uh, be safe, take care of yourself, and uh, we'll see you next time.